The story that we just heard has very famous words of peace that Jesus tells his followers in his farewell discourse. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. The word peace tends to conjure up the idea of right and wrong. I found a, a so bad it's good riddle on that topic for you. If two wrongs don't make a right, what do two rights make? First airplane. <laughs> I told you it was bad. But peace is actually, it's not so much about wrongs and rights in confrontation as it is about God's righteousness and love and desire for creation's well-being overwhelming and taking over our way of being. Last summer I stood up here and I mentioned in my off the study peace farewell discourse that the word peace from a Christian theological standpoint begins with a look at the Hebrew word shalom, which literally means fullness, well-being. And as the Theological Dictionary puts it, it's more than the lack of war, and it points to full societal and personal well-being coupled with righteousness. In that sense, peace is when all have enough and are treated justly and with respect. Studying peace, shalom, is to consider in depth not just what peace is, but ways in which to bring about personal fullness and well-being. Others' fullness and well-being and communal fullness and well-being. That's what I preached last summer. And I'm here to remind us of that, that to discuss the peace that Jesus left with us is deep and meaningful and many, many facets. We talk about this a lot. Jesus' teachings on peace matter. Teachings like loving God in all creation, especially in self and all others. Caring for those in need and on the margin of the culture. Turning the other cheek. Living nonviolently. Acting for the well-being of others. Praying and forgiving. Those are all awesome and powerful teachings that lead to peace. And this morning I'm going to revisit and focus on just one of those areas, the last one that I mentioned. Forgiving. Forgiving brings about the well-being of all. But forgiveness is, is not only hard to understand, it's also often very very hard to do. But we need to understand and do it because forgiving is a critical key to the peace Jesus leaves us in a rather unforgiving world. The earthly way is to not forgive. Which is why the peace that Jesus lived leaves us is not of this world. I found a, a story about forgiveness that can be heard as a metaphor for the earthly way of looking at forgiveness. The story is about kids, but we can, we, can, we can hear it as really about all of us at one time or another. Two little brothers were fighting just before bed, and they were still angry when their mom came in to tuck them in. It's a part of their bedtime routine. They said that familiar prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep if I should die before I wake. I pray the Lord my soul to take. When they were done, the mom tucked them in, and she noticed the youngest was still angry. And she gently advised, Timmy, don't go to sleep without forgiving your brother. And Timmy thought for a moment and whispered, Okay, Mom, I'll forgive him. But if I don't die before I wake, he better watch out in the morning. <laughs> Forgiveness is not just hard for kids to do. It's hard for adults to do. Maybe hard. And to be fair, most Christians believe and subscribe to the general notion of forgiveness as a good and godly thing that we are all called to do. But most of us are not quite sure what it is. A few weeks ago, Bruce and Hal and I read a peace project that I did during my peace studies. It was a sermon in three voices called The Breath of Forgiveness, The Face of God. And that sermon pointed out biblical stories about forgiveness, among others, that day's lectionary reading from John, where the risen Christ first appeared.
appeared to a community of disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I sent you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The reference to the breath of forgiveness in the sermon title was to that verse. The title's reference to the face of God was referring to Jacob seeing the face of God in his brother Esau's forgiving acts. The Bible evidences that we are called as God's people to forgive. And Jesus' breath of the Spirit leads to forgiveness. And when we forgive, the very face of God is experienced. But all of that still begs those million dollar questions. What is forgiveness? How do we forgive? And I preached on the topic of forgiveness before and in Bible study we have talked about forgiveness in detail more than a few times. It comes up so often I, I really need to put together a pamphlet to have in the lobby for us to hand out and take home. Read over and remind us. Forgiveness must be at the heart of any pursuit of lasting peace. And so it is part and parcel to Jesus' way to peace. And yet, truth be told, we are often not quite sure what forgiveness really is. What it means. And I think a part of the confusion stems from a notion in our culture that to forgive is to forget. To accept a wrong that's been done. But of course we can't forget many wrongs. And it's not accepting a wrong as a right. It's getting past the past to reconciliation in the present and into the future. And here's the thing. Forgiveness is not forgetting an act or a wrong. It's, it's not about letting go of a memory or a moral. It's about working to let go of that which gets in the way of restoring a relationship with the godness of another. I'm going to say that again. Forgiveness is not Forget it. It's not about letting go of a memory. It's about working to let go of that which gets in the way of restoring a relationship with the godness of another. Forgiveness, when all is said and done, restores relationship with the God's part that resides in everyone. Even a wrongdoer, even an enemy, even someone you have been hurt by, or someone you have hurt. We're called by Jesus to love God. And that person who we injured or who injured us, whether we like it or not, is part of God, created by the very Word of God as an image of God and filled from the start with God's very own breath. That's in Genesis. It's a fundamental biblical truth then that every person is soaked through and through with God. They may be hiding God. They may be trying to hold God down, not listening to God, but God is there nonetheless, always in everyone. See, God permeates all of creation, and that, my friend, includes humans, even those we do not like. Simply put, everyone is made in God's image, made from God's spoken word, and it's filled with God's very breath, and that makes them of God and a part of as we heard all throughout this Easter time, we are called by Christ to forgive everyone. And that means whenever a relationship with another is broken and in need of repair, our call is to do what we can to repair it. And that's true regardless of whether we are the victim or the wrongdoer. Yes, the wrongdoer was wrong. But repair is best done when both the parties are working at it. And don't get me wrong, it can be done with only one party, but it's best to have both involved in the process. And notice I said it's a process. It's rarely, rarely an instant happening. Sometimes the restoration of a good relationship is a short little walk, but often it's a long, hard walk, sometimes even a lifelong track. Forgiveness takes work, and it takes Time. So the first thing to get out of our heads is that when Jesus tells us to forgive in order to get peace, he's not asking us to snap our fingers and instantly forgive and forget. He's not. He, 
He's breathing the Spirit on us to fill us with the guidance and motivation, the compassion, the care, the love, and the ability to do the hard work of forgiving. He's not pouring the Spirit over us to instantly wash away harm that's done. It doesn't work like that. Instead of instant happenings, think of forgiveness as a process that can take days or weeks or months or years or sometimes, as I said, even a lifetime. Instead of thinking of a finger snap or a short straw resolution, we need to accept forgiveness as more along the lines of a, a long uphill hike. It's a hike that always begins with either one or both the victim and the wrongdoer taking steps toward forgiveness and ultimately toward the peace that Jesus left us and gives us. Working at forgiveness can sound foreign to us in this world that prizes retaliation, retribution, and revenge in a culture where talk shows and editorials and elections focus and thrive on belittling and anger and hate. But Jesus' peace is not of that world. It's not of this world. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give you as the world gives. We need to get on Jesus' otherworldly forgiveness path. We need to take that hike, not angrily sit back and promote violence as our response to harm, as the cultural model often suggests. If only the injured person takes steps in Jesus' peace, moving, Jesus' peace is moving in and moving forward up mountain toward God. If only the wrongdoer takes steps. It's still Jesus' peace moving in and moving forward up that mountain toward God. If both the injured and the wrongdoer take steps, the higher the mountain both go and the more healing there is and the more the God sparks glow and grow in each person involved in the world, the more shalom, well-being breaks in. I like to break the process of forgiveness down into eight steps. The steps the injured person can take and is called by Christ to take when able are, first of all, let someone know about the harm. The victim recognizes, declares, and details the harm. My dad used to call this kind of thing, getting it off your chest. The victim needs to tell their story to someone. I mentioned before how when lawyers take clients to mediation, settlement is much easier to obtain because finally the injured party stories get told. It's out in the open. And a good mediator makes it known that they care about that story, that it matters. The harm is disclosed and it's known to matter. The injured person also needs at some point to hike to the point where they can abandon revenge. Move on up the mountain to Shalom. The victim works toward abandoning their interest in revenge. The earthly way leads us to want to strike back at those who hurt us. Hit them, sue them, crush them. Forgiveness is letting go of the right to revenge and retribution. It's not denying you were hurt. It's denying the right to hurt back. It's turning cheek. We don't deny, we don't forget that we were hurt. We don't have to be best friends or risk being in an unsafe place with a wrongdoer again. But we do need to let go of our longing, oftentimes our obsession for revenge. But it's hard. It can take time. It's a long hike, but we must work on that in this process of forgiveness. And the third and the last thing that a victim needs to work on in this process is to get to the point where we see the wrongdoer is worthful again. We have to come to a point in the process where the wrongdoer is no longer a worthless so-and-so. We don't have to be their bud. We don't even have to hug or handshake with them. But we do need to come to the point where we are willing to be to admit that they are a human of worth and of value because they are of God and a part of God, even if they're not acting like it. If you can say you wish the wrongdoer the best and that they know God loves them, you can be sure you're on the right path to fulfilling the process of forgiveness. And it's hard stuff. It's the stuff of peace. Of, of Jesus.
Jesus' peace. And as you might expect, wrongdoers have more to do than the victim. They also have to tell the story, that is, disclose their wrongdoing. Call it a confession. Wrongdoer details the injurious conduct. It's more than that. The wrongdoer needs to show remorse, promise to refrain from the harm and misdeeds of that type in the future. And the wrongdoer must express regret through an apology to the victim or the victims and ask them for forgiveness. And finally, the wrongdoer has to work for repairing the harm that was done. Wrongdoers have to face their misdeeds, swallow their pride, face their fears, and get to work to repair what they have broken as best they can. They have hurt someone of God and a part of God. They must fix that. They are called to help the healing, to give as much toward restoring the well-being of the person they injured as best as possible. And it's hard work. It's scary, but it's absolutely what Christ calls us as wrongdoers to do. So I've just detailed eight steps in the process. The victim works to disclose the harm and abandon revenge and see the one who hurt them as worthful. The wrongdoer confesses and expresses remorse and promises not to do it again, apologizes, and asks for forgiveness. Eight steps. I'm going to say them again. The victim discloses the harm, abandons revenge, and understands the wrongdoer is worthful. The wrongdoer confesses, expresses remorse, promises not to do it again, apologizes, and asks for forgiveness. When we take any of those steps, or a combination of them, in any order, we further the process of forgiveness. We follow Jesus on his way up the mountain to peace. Not the peace of this world, but God's peace. That's shalom. That's our path to well-being as people, our well-being and caring about the others, and for the community and the world at large. And that height, that process can be short or long or somewhere in between. But whether it's short or long or in between, complete or incomplete, with just one step, one step, the process always moves the parties engaged in it up the mountain toward peace, toward shalom. I'm going to close by asking all of us to consider what step or steps toward forgiveness we have taken, and especially what steps we still need to take in a broken relationship. I'm going to sound this chime, and when we, we hear it ring, let's visualize what relationship with another might look like with steps or steps taken toward forgiveness that we, <coughs> that we might take, that we could take. Following Jesus means aiming to take a step or two in the process of forgiveness. To one day make the height, the track, the mountain of peace. Let's give it a lot of thought. Let's give it a lot of prayer. Let us know that God is with us as we do and that God is calling us up that mountain through forgiveness for Christians.